Welcome to the Three Things Podcast. I'm David Iglesias, Director of Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. You may be wondering why this podcast is called Three Things. You were probably taught by your parents, like I was, that it was impolite to talk to people about three things, religion, politics, and money. But what happens if your job is to talk about those three things? Well, let's find out. Joining me today is Don Holt, a journalist with more than 40 years of experience at the Chicago Daily News, Newsweek magazine, where he rose to the rank of Chicago bureau chief. New York City called, and he became the Newsweek news editor in charge of all 16 of the magazine's bureaus. Later, he became the managing editor of Newsweek International. He also worked at Fortune magazine and New York's Journal of Commerce. He then created and edited Fortune International. Mr. Holt graduated from Wheaton College in 1957, did graduate study in history at the University of Chicago and Roosevelt University. He also served as a U.S. Army officer in the 1950s after completing Wheaton's ROTC program. He's married to Lolita, class of 1960, and has been married 61 years. They have four children and 12 grandchildren. I am personally thankful to one of the grandchildren, Abby Crowder, who was one of my students in my Southeast Asia study program in 2019. She's the one who told me about her grandfather's illustrious career. Mr. Holt's front row seat as a journalist covered some of the most tumultuous years in the 20th century from the 1960s and 1970s. He interviewed seven U.S. presidents or presidential candidates, including Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter, Hubert Humphrey, and Bobby Kennedy, among numerous political luminaries. He is the author of The Justice Machine and recipient of numerous journalistic awards, including the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award. Welcome to Three Things Podcast, Mr. Holt. Glad to be here. Thank you, David. First, I have an admission to make. My father, who was a news hound, subscribed to both Newsweek and Time for years. And even as a boy, I would read both magazine covers, cover to cover, rather. I suspect I've read some of your articles. My second admission is that I find the 1960s and 1970s to be especially fascinating from a political economic perspective. And I'm old enough to remember 1968, which I believe to be one of the pivotal years of the 20th century. So my first question, and uh, I got to tell you, it's a little bit daunting to interview a journalism professor and a career journalist, but <laughs> what, what led you into journalism and not something else? Well, I think it started with it started with writing. I knew probably in high school that, that when I wrote things for papers or for the, the teachers responded favorably. And when I went on to college, uh, the same thing. I had some teachers at Wheaton College that were very supportive of my appreciative of, of my writing and told me so. And I think it was that was made me feel pretty good about that. Uh, Helen Simmel, a professor of English, was the first person that I think brought that to my attention directly. She called me, had me stay after class. And she said, you don't have a clue about the rules of grammar. You couldn't pass a grammar test if your life depended on it. But you would never make mistakes and you write very well. And she said, I think I'm guessing that you started reading at a very young age. I said, well, that's, for, that's true. And, and Peter Veltman, another professor at Wheaton, had uh, been a newspaper man before he got into academia. He was very encouraging. So I knew that, that I wanted to make a living somehow in writing. And I didn't really identify journalism exactly uh, until I was just getting out of college and looking for a job. And I managed to find a job at uh, the Elmhurst Press, which is a very well done weekly newspaper in Elmhurst, Illinois, in the suburb of Chicago. As a sports editor, I did it for one year. And then I went on to other things, uh, uh, general, but, but I knew from about the year on that I, that this is what I, what I wanted. And, and I think you said you also wrote for the Wheaton Record, the campus newspaper. Is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And it makes two of us. And uh, well, here's another foundational question. What is news? 
My definition of news is the deviation from the normal. Anything that deviates from what we would expect and what should be happening is news. And the bigger the deviation, the bigger the news. Now, sometimes those deviations can be positive. Sometimes they are, but mostly they're not. Mostly you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be attracted to a newscast that said uh, that 485 airliners today operate safely and all landed uh, more or less on time. Uh, that's what they're supposed to do. That's not news. Mm -hmm. But if one goes down, that's news. And I think it's, uh, it, 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 and I think my life is, uh, my career is kind of, not my life, I've had a pleasant life, but my career is uh, filled with bad news. I think I, the war is going on now in uh, Israel and I covered the 1973 war, terrible, uh, terrible thing. Uh, Richard Speck who killed eight nurses on the south side of Chicago. I walked through the apartment right after that happened. I was the first reporter there. That, so that's the kind of thing, bad news. It's, uh, so I actually remember the Richard Speck case. I was a kid, but I just remember being yeah. shocked because uh, that happened in the late 1960s. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I, because again, my father, the news hound also watched the evening news. So um, yeah. if I didn't read it in Newsweek or time, I saw it on CBS evening news with Walter Cronkite, which was his favorite. Uh, just a quick aside here. What did you see in Speck's uh, apartment? Was it, was there anything out of the ordinary? Well, except for the blood on the floor. Uh... <laughs> oh my <laughs> wow. Okay. See, I, I I've forgotten the details that he killed well, the nurses. It was the, he he broke into this apartment of, of these girls who lived uh, together. They were uh, nursing students. One of them is related to Wheaton, and hmm. uh, yeah, it was. It, I, I I actually walked through. What? Oh my. Well, let me ask you this. So I, I would agree with you uh, that news is something that's different than the ordinary. And that's certainly what uh, I've read. And I have read a book about uh, the rules of journalism written by a friend of mine. Uh, has the definition changed in your view due to social media and the 24 seven news cycle? You know, I don't think so. That, not, not for me, uh, because I would, I would uh, I, I deal in, in public events uh social media is so focused on opinion mm -hmm. and uh i i'm quite uncomfortable with it i because it's 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 so different there's no filters uh right you know when i was working on these publications that you mentioned they were wonderful places and we had a enormous amount of fact checking and and editorial meetings to decide whether or not we would cover something i mean and so that's all missing in blogs and 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 uh so i don't i i think it, it it's sort of going back to to the way this country was uh, at, at its founding when anybody could buy a printing press mm. and get into the print business and they did and i think I, when I read a, a lot about that period, and I have, I see, I, I feel like it's very similar to unregulated blogs <laughs> and social media that just, just spews out there and there's no, and right now <clears throat> they're protected from, uh, from libel. So there's no, there's no filter. That's right. And I think that's what a lot of consumers don't understand. Um, that they should, that there are rules in journalism mm, in terms of checking oh. the, ver the veracity of, of the source, fact checking, whereas anyone in the proverbial pair of pajamas can say anything about anyone without checking exactly. a fact. Exactly. And I think that, uh, you know, we did uh, care an awful lot about, I, this is going to sound a bit pompous, but, but I always felt that, that in journalism, we were kind of alone, except probably for the academy and science, uh, people who were dedicated to finding out what the truth was, regardless of where it led. Uh, I think other professions are is honorable, adult lawyers, but they if you are one and you know, and my son is one and you've met him, uh, 
but lawyers are advocates. They have right. a point of view. They have to, business people are pushing a particular product against another. So, so we, and I can tell you, you know, sincerely that in those meetings, regardless of, and this is what I think is missing now. Uh, I, I, we can talk about this later, but I think mm -hmm. what went on during the uh, previous administration, I guess I wish I would have been in some of those editorial meets. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was the same as the same appreciation we had to try to, to try to present a fair picture. Right, right. Do you think there's been any corrosive effect that the social media has had on traditional journalism? Do you, do you find the same attention to truth is still there or has it been corroded in any way? I don't think it's been cro uh, corroded by, uh, by social media, although I, I really can't measure it. I think it certainly, I think it, it perhaps corrodes society uh, in the larger sense, but I, I, I'm not sure about, about actual journalism. I think what happened, uh, I don't want to go into this too deeply, but uh, I think the the election of 2016, which was a mm -hmm. cataclysmic event in political life, created a pushback at the highest levels of, of certain journalistic or organizations that I think were, was corrosive. I think it'll go away, but uh, it might take a while. I see. Well, like Solomon wrote thousands of years ago, there's nothing new under the sun. So I'm sure something like this has probably happened in yeah. in human history. Let, let me let me get back to uh, to uh, journalism in, in Wheaton College. Uh, it's my sense, and I, again, I I've not taken a poll on this, so this is very unscientific. But it seems like it's a lot more common now for Wheaton grads to become journalists. But the question I have for you is, was that a common career path when you graduated in the late 1950s? Uh, no, it was not. And I think that, uh, I think for a long time, I was the only Wheaton grad, explicit Christian that was known. And there was a, then there was a, I forget his name at the AP, it came on later, but, and he was not a Wheaton grad, although he went to Wheaton grad school. I can't think of his name. I'm sorry. Was it Osling? Was it Richard Osling? Uh, no, that's later. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, I, I, but he was a, he was an AP. But but no, I was I was really the only one, and I I don't know what that what that I knew a lot of people in my classes that went into various kinds of journalism, but most of them went into trade journalism, went to, uh, working for industrial magazines, uh, and I did uh, run into Philip Yancey. Oh, yes. I went to a, uh, uh, sometime in the mid-career, uh, I, I found myself at a banquet where he was the speaker. I was just a guest. And I went up to him afterward and I introduced myself. And he said, I know who you are. Said, you're, <laughs> you're our hero. He said, I went into, I went to work for InterVarsity Magazine and you went to work for Newsweek. <laughs> and I wow. talked a little bit about that. Uh, uh, he is a very talented, obviously, person, and, yes. and and he could have, all of the people that I knew who were writing could have made it, but there was some kind of, I, I don't know, I, I think it was, maybe, maybe Wheaton was too much of a bubble at that time, and it just seemed scary to get outside of it, I don't know, I did not, though, I was, from the start, I knew I wanted to be in, in mainstream journalism, and I just, that, that just was, uh, Felt, I felt that that's where I could do it. Was it was it hard to be a Christian, a practicing, uh, self-proclaimed Christian in that era when it was probably uncommon for there to be other, uh, you know, Christians? Well, that's a good question. I, no, I, you know, is it hard to be a Christian? Is any yes in anything? <laughs> <laughs> a Christian lawyer, a Christian person, uh, but. Uh, I, I know I didn't. In fact, I, you know, I was known. I wasn't. Uh, I'll give you an example. We were having when Jimmy Carter in his campaign said he was born again. We're sitting in an editorial meeting on Madison Avenue in New York City. What's that? And so they they sent for a Bible to the library. And it came and they all turned to me. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> 
Let me ask you this. What did you like most about being a journalist? You know, I talked about the bad news. Uh, and this, this, again, is going to sound a little Pollyannish, but I think it's really the way I felt. Uh, I, all of the bad news I encountered uh, made me think of the verse, the Bible verse that uh, talks about men love darkness rather than light. Yes. And I really felt like one of the things we were doing is shedding light. Mm -hmm. And I really, I really, I felt a career that I felt that I was really devoting my life to something worthwhile in that sense. Uh, I think I, uh, Gary Hogan, who started the International Justice Ministry, came to Wheaton College just as I started to teach there in 1999. Mm -hmm. We had lunch. And he pointed out to me, he said, everything that I am fighting, uh, human trafficking and, 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 and so forth, child prostitution, uh, is illegal in the, in the countries where it was yet, but it goes on because nobody knows about it. And he mm -hmm. said, the way, we, the way we fought it was to bring it to light, mm -hmm. press conferences, lawsuits. And uh, I think that in a certain way, that's that's how I felt. That's how I thought about my career. I, th I don't remember which Supreme Court justice said that sunshine is the best um, antiseptic. But yes, uh, I, I I think that's a very good. I think that's true. I feel that way, yeah. and so that that is what I liked about. The other thing about it, yeah, you like about you like about being on somewhat on the inside. You're not always the doors are often closed, uh, and you're on the other side, mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, and the travel and the, being with people that, you know, bold faced names and, and discovering that they're people just like, just like everybody else. And, uh, so that was the fun part about it. Well, absolutely. And, and to use a, uh, analogy from the wizard of Oz, you got to take a peek behind the curtain and see That's how right. the image was created. <laughs> so what did you like the least about being a journalist? Oh, I don't think I, you know what? I'm not sure I ever had a bad day at work. I may have had some difficult days. I, <laughs> That's amazing. I, After 40 years, 40 I plus love years. I getting up every morning and go to work. I really did. Do you encourage young Christians to go into journalism as a career? Because I see that you taught at Wheaton College as an adjunct for, I, I think, did. seven yeah. years. For seven years. It, it was, uh, and by the way, I just, found that such a nourishing experience. I loved it. Mm. Uh, in fact, I think I was, <clears throat> some of my colleagues who have been at it for, for a long time, uh, got tired of me being so exuberant <laughs> <laughs> in the halls. I just love it, I just love it. Uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would concern, I would, I would encourage anybody, but right now, uh, they say, you know, Wheaton does not have a strong print component. Uh, and it has sort of given up some of the uh, broadcast side too, but uh, moving more into into communication specialties like conflict revolution resolution and so forth. But, but I think that uh, uh, it's different. I would say probably tr print is not as easy to get into because it's beginning to be supplanted. TV is good. I don't know. I just think we're, we are going to need, we're going to need people who tell us what's going on. And so it's a great, it's a great career, but it's not, it's not, it's not the same uh, in so many ways. I have a good friend who was a television, mm -hmm. uh, Tim Johnson, Dr. Tim Johnson was the, was the ABC medical correspondent. He was on Good Morning America for many years. And every so often we sit around and have lunch and say, boy, we were in the golden years, weren't we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's so much more diffused and difficult. And, but, but yeah, I would, I would, sure. Well, and there were so many, there were so few venues for news. You had the major three networks. Yeah, right. Um, and then you had AP, UPI, the major oh. newspapers, and that was really about it. Now yeah. you're getting bombarded with information. You, you, you don't always know how well it's been vetted. 
whatever Uncle Walter Cronkite said, you know, we believed. And <laughs> well, that's right, because when he said, and that's the way it is. That's the way it is. So can you tell us a little bit about how your Christian faith affected your, your writing in particular and in general your career? Well, uh, I think in terms of my, my writing, there are, there are places I wouldn't work, mm -hmm. but in terms of, uh, of actual uh, approaching the job, uh, I think I relied on get the, get the facts, spell the names right, and, and, and get down to, to, to business. Now, if some particular issues, if they had a uh, ethical content, I would like to think that my Christian perspective was a, was a, was a positive one and was a good one and would, would really help tell the story. But uh, uh, as I said, it, I think it was like being in, in any other walk of life. You, you, you live your life and it, your Christian faith helps you do that. Yes. So I wrote for my center's newsletter that 1968 was uh, a watershed year. And I, I think you might agree with me on that. And I read in your bio that you covered the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago mm -hmm. uh, and the resulting Chicago 7 trial. So can you tell us a little bit about that? What, what did you learn from that? What, what oh, were your well, takeaways? You know, absolutely. I, I agree with you that that was a pivotal year in a pivotal decade. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it wasn't just that year it it was the it was most of the 60s and certainly this into the 70s the protest eras over the vietnam war the the protest eras on campus uh the uh and really rebellion in the air uh in, in so many ways so i think that uh, that particular I think about '68. I, I was there. I was in. I was a bureau chief, and and so I was. I was in, on the convention floor. My my bureau reporters were out in the streets, and most of them got beat up. Oh my! To some extent, uh, and at least got got whacked uh, by by whom? A policeman with a stick. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so I I was I, I went to it was raging out there. So I went to Mayor Daly, and and he was sitting. He was sitting in the in the, his delegation because he was the Chicago Democratic kingpin. He was sitting right. His delegation was right in front, right, right under the podium, and he was on the aisle. So I came down, and and I knew him. He knew me. I'd mm -hmm. done some stories for for both Newsweek and uh, and the Daily News. I went, got down on one knee, and I said, "Mr. Mayor, what what do you think that's what's going on outside the convention hall?" It's not pretty. And he, he didn't, he looked at me and he raised his hand a little bit and he sort of snapped his fingers and two guys came on, on both sides of me and lifted me. Oh. <laughs> he carried me out of the, off, away from the mayor and dumped me in an aisle somewhere else. Oh, good grief. Uh, and, uh, from then on, nobody talked to the mayor, uh, uh he, you know, it, it was a, this. It was a focal point of a very bad year. Yes. 1968 is where when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in California. Uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. There were riots, uh, and and I think in the terms of the Chicago police, uh, in the spring in April, when 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 King was assassinated, the West Side just completely blew up. Hmm. Uh, there was, you can still see blocks that are mm -hmm. never been built up. They were just burned out. Uh, and I was out there. I was on the streets for, the, for that whole night. The police were very restrained. They, they, they had, there had been riots in, in, in Newark and, and in Los Angeles and in Detroit. And the, and the police were trying to be more restrained. I think 41 people were killed in Detroit. Oh my. I was there too. And and uh so I think the that night I don't think anybody got shot, but they did burn down most of the neighborhood. 
and the police were, as I say, I thought I thought did a very good, very all you could do to keep people happy or to keep people safe. And uh, the next day, the mayor had a press conference and he said that the police had disobeyed his orders. Huh. I had ordered them to shoot to kill looters, uh, oh, rioters, wow, business, and shoot to shoot to maim looters. And I told Superintendent Conisk, the chief at that time was a guy named Jim Conisk, a long, long time Chicago policeman. Well, they were from Conisk on down, they were furious. I mean, mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. they were being scapegoated. They, yes. had, they had done what they had been trained to do. And I think that had a lot to do with the attitudes on the street. We're mm -hmm. not going to let the mayor take us over the coals again. We're going to, we want to clean this up. We'll clean this up. We're going to, we're going to clear this park. We're going to clear this park. And I think that that, I really think that that had a lot to do with it. Uh, and, and so when the riot, when the demonstrators created enough of a, of a issue that they felt they could move on them, they did. So for some of our listeners who might not know about this, uh, a lot of this is captured on on camera. So you can go on YouTube and actually you see can, yes. mm -hmm. the police um, just beating up everyone who was in the area. It didn't matter if they were protesters or somebody just walking by the street or even a delegate of the convention. It seemed like everybody, and, and you're, you're saying some of your journalists were getting beat up. This was a change too. I mean, in, in those in those very violent years that preceded it, uh, reporters on the street were were treated well by police. It, it, it would never have happened uh, if we were in a, in a riot situation. And, and so the press, uh, but I think that they became the enemy to the policemen too. So I see. I, now, were they dressed in anything that identified them as oh yeah. being members of the press? Oh, well, not so much in those days. Now they do in war zones. They have a big press. Up. But I think that uh, I, I, I think most of them would just have a wave, wave a press card and something, something like that. Now this uh, and there were uh, there were prosecutions as a result of of this this riot. Um, and uh, there was a recent movie. It just came out earlier this year called The Trial of the Chicago Seven. Yes. Uh, ha have you seen the movie? I have. And I, I think it's. It's uh, Sorkin, and he's very good at, at getting it right. Uh, uh, he did West Wing and some of the other. Political. Well, he did one of my favorite movies, A Few Good Men. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how you're going to react to this uh, question or comment, but I remember last year people asking me that things were really bad and the worst it had, it had been since the Civil War. And, and my answer was always this. I remember 1968, and what's going yeah. on now is not good, but what was going on then was on a order of magnitude worse, just in terms of the the, the scope of the protest and the, the the tearing apart of the country that we survived then. So I would actually say, we're going to get through this. I, what, what are you, what, what are your thoughts on that? I couldn't agree more. I could have I could have said just what you said. I mean, I think. That's that's the way I feel. I I look at what's going on now, and I I tell my younger children and and friends, uh, uh, we'll get through it because we did. So we've talked a little bit about um, some of your career, but I also know from reading your bio that you uh, interviewed Martin Luther King Jr., who was uh, the civil rights icon of the era, and certainly someone whose words are still resonate today. Right. Can you tell me about how that meeting went? Oh yeah, I sure can. Uh, uh, that was the summer of 1966, and I had just become, had just been made bureau chief. I was 30 years old. Oh my! And I had not. This, the civil rights movement in the South was very exciting for reporters. All of my colleagues that I knew well would tell stories of, of being on the bridge and 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 Birmingham jail and all all of those things that were were so uh, instrumental in the actual beginnings and and flowering of the civil rights movement and King coming to a to tremendous prominence. 
And I, I had missed it. I was in Chicago. I was covering mm. other stuff and I didn't. So when he came to Chicago and the, he came for the summer, he was going to march into white neighborhoods. And the purpose mm. was to get the city of Chicago to change its or to, or, or to pass open housing legislation so you could, you could break neighborhoods. And, and I, 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 so he marched every night. Mm -hmm. uh, into Mayor Daly's white neighborhood, into back of the yards, and all these sort of old, old white ethnic enclaves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and uh, so I signed myself almost every night. I could have sent other people, but I wanted to, I wanted I wanted to do this, mm -hmm. and and so I would with small reporters, it, you know, because it go, something that goes on like that every night for. For summer, you're not going to be out every night, but I, I did quite a few of them, and uh, we walked along. He would walk down the middle of the street with his group, or Abernathy and and uh, that whole whole group, and he, uh, I would, I would be there with a few other reporters, and we wore construction helmets. Why is that? Well. So we wouldn't get hit with rocks. Oh my! Because they were coming, and and uh, of course he didn't. Mm. And one thing that I gained from that was a tremendous respect for the physical courage of, of that man. Mm. Uh, I, I was there the night that he was hit and did go to the ground. Uh, yeah, I took a rock in the body. I took a rock in the head once, but it bounced off my helmet. But but we were protected and and he and he was not and I thought what that that just gave me tremendous respect for his hmm. his, his courage. Uh, I'll say. And I interviewed him. He uh, a, a couple of times I went to. He took an apartment in a in a south side neighborhood. I sat with him there, talked with him. Very serious. Uh, very mm -hmm. dedicated, very very focused. I guess you, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. you, you would think that. Uh, uh, I found him impressive in person, uh, well spoken, and uh, uh, he succeeded. By the end of the summer, they did pass open housing legislation. And when you said break neighborhoods, uh, just. To, for the listener understands, uh, redlining was practiced in Chicago at that time. So neighborhoods were kept uh, certainly everywhere, but, but right. in Chicago. And I and yes, there were there were there were white neighborhoods that, and they were not, you know, they were not fancy suburbs. They were, right. they were working class, cops, firemen, you know, construction workers lived in these little houses, uh, but they were fiercely. Uh, defensive and mm -hmm. and the it, it was really something to these people would the neighborhood people would get lined the sidewalk and they would scream and yell and say things that you wouldn't want to hear oh boy and and the hate mm -hmm. it, it, but it was hate it was hate driven by fear mm -hmm. uh fear of of losing their own place or losing whatever you know it was i i tried to understand it now let's talk a little bit about Bobby Kennedy, whom I believe you met as well. Oh yeah, can you tell me your uh, recollections of him? I covered his. He jumped in in 1968. I had been nosing around, and that uh, I went up and and saw Gene McCarthy. Remember mm -hmm. him? Sure. And he uh, uh, grabbed him and and went out for coffee, and he told me all about what what he was going to do, and then he did it, uh, and he entered the race. Then Bobby came in late. The McCarthy people were pretty annoyed at that. They thought that they <laughs> they had they had a lock on the anti-war group, but uh, they, he kind of so he came in and entered all the primaries in the Midwest. And and as the Midwest guy, I was assigned to cover him, and I was on the plane with him uh, through Indiana, uh, Wisconsin, South Dakota, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. We were flying out to Nebraska. Uh, he's he he was so different than I, I never I never knew Jack. I just saw him on TV. Right. Uh, but uh, I did know Teddy. Uh, 
and both Jack and and Ted were gregarious Irish guys with all the charm that is the the, the uh, people are famous for. Mm-hmm. Bobby was not. He he had he he did not have that. He was very very serious, mm. uh, very withdrawn in many ways, uh, but also courageous. I mean he he would uh, and he was a terrible speech maker. But, really. Yeah, he, he, if he, if they gave him a text, he'd be droning through it. But then in the question period, someone would throw a question at him, and he would answer it. And he would he would he would nail it. Uh, t- tell me your beliefs about why you believe the 1960s and early 70s were so turbulent. Well, uh, of course, I think it. it, it the, the civil rights movement was was a, a flashpoint in the South, and I think it started in the fifties with you know, Rosa Parks and the bus and all these mm-hmm. things, that, and it coalesced. And I've wondered myself. It's a it's an historical question as to why it happened then, but it coming after the war. I uh, in the nineteen fifties were just a, just five to ten years after the end of World War Two. But it it was is a spontaneous. I think a lot. I think a lot of uh, young people, white people, joined in, uh, and I think to be, it, it was. It seemed to be time. So that, but that was explosive enough, and then you laid on top of that the the, the tragic Vietnam War. I have a one view of that. In 1964, I had just joined Newsweek, and and. Uh, they gave me just as I was not assigned to any campaign, but mm-hmm. but the people who were had to take a day off or a week off, and so in the in the fall I was given a shot to travel with Johnson for a week and with uh, Barry Goldwater. Oh my! And it was it was a very again a wonderful experience, but that campaign. Uh, it's well known. I mean, it's it's on the record. Uh, every stop we went to, Lyndon Johnson said, "I am not going to send American boys nine thousand mm-hmm. miles to do what Asian boys should do mm-hmm. for themselves." And mm-hmm. he got a tremendous roar. And and conversely, Goldwater was saying that we should defoliate the jungle, which we ultimately did. That we should escalate. That we should. Uh, and and so it was a fairly clear cut choice. Johnson. I'm sure thought that he won a landslide because he was so, such a great guy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Politicians have that view of themselves, but I think it was a I think it was a referendum on should we escalate in Vietnam and the, the people. And when you go to war without without the people with you, or explicitly as as shown at the ballot box against you. You better win it quick. Yes. And he didn't. Let me ask you this. So I'd forgotten that you met LBJ. Uh, I, in your bio, it said you'd met seven uh, president, sitting presidents or uh, candidates. Who did you find to be the most interesting? Oh, I, I, I think that uh, it's hard to pick one. Uh, the candidacy of, of Jimmy Carter was wildly fascinating because of what uh, the man himself was kind of mm-hmm. not so exciting, although he's a good man and he's shown, shown to be the best ex-president in, in, in America, in, in probably in world history. I'll say. But uh, uh, so that was that. I, I Reagan was uh, very... Uh, a fascinating guy. I think that Johnson, I only saw a little bit, so I really couldn't. I've read, I've read uh, the, the three volume biography of Johnson. Mm-hmm. I recommend that to anybody. Johnson was a very interesting character in his own life. Not particularly uh, a man, a man who wasn't totally ethical in his, his early right. political life. Right. But uh, 
uh, gives you a window into, into how that goes. And then, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that's, that's uh, Reagan, I think. Reagan, Reagan was, I wrote a cover story for, for, for Fortune magazine in the spring of 1980. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of out of it. I had been, I'd been at Fortune doing uh, business and economics for a number of years. I was kind of out of the political life. And late in the afternoon on a Friday, we were in a meeting. It was just a regular story conference. And somebody said, you know what we should do? We can't cover primaries and all this. Reagan was going through the primaries against George H. W. Bush and John Anderson from from the congressman from oh uh, sure from Illinois, but we can't cover that. But why don't we just do a story that said, if Reagan became president, what would he be like? Huh. It had never been done. It's done now all the time. If you every, every <laughs> campaign you see, every publication will do that. Yes, uh, and and eyes turned toward me. And because they knew I was the only one in the room that had any political experience <laughs> on the national level. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll do that. And the editor said, well, you know, you got to do it fast. We we're in the middle of a two week cycle over the issue. He said, we need it in the next the issue after this one closed. It. They, they gave me three weeks. Wow. So I said, OK, I'll do it. So I went, went home on the train. Lita picked me up as she always did. Mm -hmm. We were going to go out to dinner it was Friday night. I said, "I got to, I got to make a call." So I stopped at a, at a telephone booth. Remember this? Remember those? I do remember those things <laughs> <laughs> before before cell phones. And I called Jerry Lubinow, the San Francisco bureau chief in Newsweek, who you you know who knew well and used to work mm -hmm. with me. And I said, I still had his his number somewhere in my memory and, and, uh, or at least in my books. And so I said, Jerry, I got, I got to do this. They've asked me, I don't know anybody. Who do I call? <laughs> Give me Ed Mises number, private number. Oh and, yeah. And, uh, and it, you can't get him. There's a couple of other guys. Could... So I hung up and still in the phone booth, I called Ed Mies. I got him and cause it was a private number for, you know, for the press. Told him what was happening. I said, we want to do a piece and Fortune, and I'm the Fortune editor. And, uh, he said, we're in South, South Carolina. Come on down tomorrow and, and join us. So I did that and spent a week with him. And that was... Oh, my. And I, I said to Ed on the, on the outset, I said, Ed, I have to have a sit down at some time during yes. this week with, with Ronald Reagan. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Days went by. It was it was great. It was great. We we were all over the country, and and crowds were were big. And he was pretty good. He wasn't always as good as people remember him. Sometimes he'd get get a little tired, but he was a good order, and he was terrific. And so now we now we, now we're in San Francisco. It's the end of the week, Friday. So Ed, we gotta have this. Gotta have it. Oh yeah, yeah. So. And Friday goes by, and he says, "Okay." He said, uh, "As the day, middle of the day, he says, oh, okay, we're wrapping up today, and 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 uh, Ron's going down, going home for the weekend, and uh, we've got a small plane on, and we're going to take you can ride with him. You can ride with us uh, down to uh, Burbank, and because it was a twin engine uh, prop plane, uh -huh. about eight passengers." Uh, it was slow. It took a long time to get there. So I had about three and a half hours with him. Nice. And we're sitting together in, in this shiny plane in the back. It has been said that he was hard of hearing. So we were shouting over the engine noise. <laughs> uh, but that was my interview. But it was a long one. And, and he was very jovial. I mean, he was jovial. He was tired. But he was, he, he was very good. I got some good stuff for my piece. And uh, you remember the they were talking about the tax cuts. Yes. And, and everybody was the voodoo economics that uh, was called by George H.W. Yep. And uh, so I asked him what, you know, what, what, what's the downside? What if, and he said, well, you know, we'll be doing it over three years. And if, if, if 
the first year he wasn't working, we could just stop. He'd never said that. Hmm. And I put it in the piece. He never said it again. <laughs> <laughs> like Fascinating. Joke. Fascinating. Yeah. Which of your jobs did you find the most rewarding? Correspondent, bureau chief, news editor, or managing editor? I liked uh, I liked them all. I, that's a cop-out answer. <laughs> but I would say that as an editor of a magazine, I thought that was one of the more creative jobs anyone could have. Mm. Uh, especially at Fortune, where we didn't, uh, at Newsweek, you had a format and you had to fill it every week. Right. Uh, and you could be creative on the, on the margins, but, but, but what I loved about fortune is that you started every cycle with a with blank pages and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you could do it any way you wanted. So that was, I thought it was very good. I, I had, uh, at the international edition, we, I did a, uh, special edition on Asia mm -hmm. and, uh, I subsequently did several more. But this was when Japan was was on the rise. Everybody was fearful. They were they were buying the Rockefeller Center, and they were you know they were going to take over America. Uh, hmm. And and so I did this entire issue on Japan, but a whole of Southeast Asia and all of the all the economic issues having to do with that in Thailand. Uh, and I got a personal note from Jack Welch, who was then the chairman of. General Electric, and I later got to meet him on a number of occasions. So I had, I guess, I had already met him once, uh, saying it was the best thing he'd ever written, and he was sending it to all his top executives. So that was that was. Oh, absolutely! That's very gratifying. So after your career, and what year did you uh, retire from being an active journalist? Ninety-nine. So after that, you became an adjunct journalism professor here at Wheaton right. for seven years. Uh, what did you learn uh, about Wheaton students who I believe would have been Generation X at that time? Yeah, uh, well, they were great. I, I, I found them, uh, we got along really well. I thought they were sh sharp. Uh, the ones that I had were going to change the world. I think it, they haven't yet, but... Uh, you can hold your breath. Uh, I, I thought it was great fun. I, I thought they were uh, they were they were very they were intrigued. Is a guy who had just come out of New York, and they they kind of seemed to you know the first you, you would uh, I think appreciate this too as a as a professional who became a teacher uh, the first night. They had, it came about because they didn't know, they had lost some faculty members and they didn't know who was going to teach us. So they had this basic journalism class at night on Monday nights. And it, was, it went for four hours and just one that, that, that a week because they thought they'd have to pull somebody from the community. Well, just be, that spring I had been, I was on the uh, National Advisory Board of the Center for Applied Christian Ethics case, which still oh, sure. And uh, C. Edward Coop was our chair, and former Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, yes, and I, you, you people might remember him. He used to wear a uniform. He said that my people are wearing it. I will wear it too. He seemed quite pompous to a lot of people. When I met him, I discovered that he calls himself Chick, and I thought anybody who <laughs> is named Coop and calls himself Chick is not pompous. <laughs> I've never heard. Of I got to know him very well. But so I was out for a meeting and I was sitting with the provost and he was telling me about this problem with journalism. I said, you know, I'm just about to retire. What if I came out for a year? Oh, that'd be great. So he did, I did. And, and I stayed age seven and, and I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> this, has been, this has been fun. Well, I wanna thank you for your time, sir. And, uh, and I look forward to continuing this with you over lunch. Absolutely. You have been listening to Wheaton's Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics podcast. Three things with host David Iglesias. Join us again in two weeks for a new interview with an accomplished faith, political, and business leader.